I'd like to call the March 10th, 2011 meeting of the Williamsburg City Council to order. Ms. Scott, would you call the roll, please? Ms. Mitson? Here. Mr. Pond? Here. Mayor Holman? Here. Mr. Pryling? Here. Mr. Foster? Here. First order of business today is council minutes from the meetings of February 7th and February 10th, 2011, and the special meeting of February 23rd, 2011. Do I have any additions or corrections? Mr. Mayor, I move that council approve the meeting minutes from February 7th and February 10th, 2011, and the special meeting minutes of February 23rd, 2011. Second. I have a motion and a second. Ms. Scott, would you call the roll, please? Ms. Newton? Aye. Mr. Paul? Aye. Mayor Holman? Aye. Mr. Fry? Aye. Mr. Foster? Aye. Um, we do have one matter of special privilege today, and uh, I speak for council on this. It's with great sadness that council notes the passing of former city council member Russell Tabb on Friday, March 4th, 2011. Russell Tabb served the city as a member of council with honor and distinction from 2000 to 2004, and I was privileged to serve alongside him. He was the first African American elected to council since Reconstruction and was a role model not only for the African American community, but also for the entire community. His roots ran deep in the Williamsburg community, and he dedicated his life to making it a better place. His service on council was just one of the ways he was able to help improve this community. His 45 years of service at Colonial Williamsburg, where he was respected and admired, are a testament to his enormous capabilities and to the impact he had on those around him. He was committed to his work and career. He was equally committed to his church. And in addition to city council, he served on the boards of numerous civic organizations and charities. Perhaps even more importantly, he was beloved. I remember distinctly council's swearing-in ceremony the year that Russell was elected. Tab supporters cheered the loudest, and the celebration was an affirmation of what was special about Russell and what is special about our community. Russell Tab was a good man and a good friend. We will miss him. We send our heartfelt condolences to his wife, Viola, his son, Terry, and the entire Tab family. I believe the uh, funeral for Russell is tomorrow at 11 o'clock at First Baptist Church, and I, I'm sure there will be quite a turnout from the community. So uh, those of you that, that wish to go, please know that time and, and date. Um, our next order of business are, are public hearings, and today we have three. Uh, the first public hearing is uh, the Bladen Site Housing uh, Production Project CBBG <coughs> application, proposed resolution 11-01. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, members of City Council. Um, as we discussed at the February work session, the City and the Williamsburg Redevelopment and Housing Authority uh, have been working to redevelop the blatant building site for additional affordable elderly and disabled housing. Uh, the, the project that we presented to you in February is a two-phase project that requires multiple funding sources, including a Community Development Block Grant, or CDBG, administered by the Virginia Department of Housing and Community Development. The CDBG funds will be used for relocation of the existing storm sewer, construction of a new storm drainage system for the property, construction of a new parking lot, and for construction of a courtyard, landscaping, stormwater retention pond, and additional lighting for the site. A public hearing and a resolution supporting the project is required as part of the CDBG application. The city and the housing authority will be submitting an application at the end of this month. As explained in the attached resolution, the CDBG funding is one of four funding sources we'll be pursuing in order to move the project forward, including 202 fund, HUD 202 funding, uh, additional contribution from the city and the housing authority. All of these funding sources have to be awarded or appropriated in order for the project to move forward. 
Um, it's recommended that Council approve the proposed resolution 11-01 authorizing the City Manager to submit the CDBG application in the amount of $472,710 for Phase 1 <coughs> of the Blatant Site Housing Production Project. And uh, you see before you here is a uh, schematic of the concept um, for Phase 1 for the project. In addition to what's been provided to you for, for the public hearing today, um, we have received three letters of support from residents um, that live in the Blayton Building. The first is from um, Mrs. Castleman, Elwes Castleman, and she's the president of the Blayton's Residence Council. We've also received a letter of support for the project and the application from a resident, Renee Eisenhower, who lives in the currently in the Blayton Building. And we also re received a letter of support from Yvonne Holmes, who's also a resident of Blayton. They could not be with us this afternoon. And that's all I have to start off our present book. Thank you. Uh, let's go to council to see if there are any questions for Ms. Miller before we open the public hearing. Okay. If not, uh, we'll open the public hearing. Anybody which, with, who wishes to speak to the, to the uh, Blayton Building uh, application, uh, please come forward. If you do, please state your name and, and address. My name is Randy O'Neill. I live in Jane City County, 109 Sheffield Road, and I think that's a wonderful addition to Williamsburg. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak? I'm Lois Klein, and I reside at 231 Claiborne Drive in Williamsburg City. And I just happened to be here on another matter, and I read in the newspaper about the Blayton House. As a uh, retired public health nurse, I am concerned about placing seniors outside of their own homes. It tends to be confusion, confusing for them. They develop a lot more health issues. And um, uh, my understanding is that it's less expensive to put it, them into already existing housing um, with home visits by medical personnel as ne and nursing personnel as, as needed. And I just wanted to give you that input. Thank you very much. Anybody else wish to speak? If not, I'll... Oh. Okay. <clears throat> Terrence Wheel, Harry Tubman Drive. Good afternoon. Um, my question, and I, I can, I was talking to Mr. Hungerman about it, but it has to do with the zoning, rezoning, and when that process comes in. And my concern would be that we're, we look at a project and we rezone the property to make the project happen, and then for some reason the project does not happen. So I was interested in the uh, steps that, that will be taken uh, for rezoning the property, what it might be rezoned. Uh, and uh, secondly, next to number one, there's a, a large square there. I, I, I don't have the plan, but I don't remember that larger square, and maybe I missed it last time, but I uh, just wanted to ask about when, when, attached to number yeah, one. When we come back to council, we'll, we'll address both of those questions to Ms. Miller. Thank you very so, much. Th thank you, Terrence. Anybody else wish to speak? If not, I'll close the public hearing and come back to uh, council for any questions. Ms. Miller, I think we may have some questions for you. Um, let, let me follow Mr. Uh, Is, on number one, what the, is the it this area yeah, that, right here? that area, I, I think that's what he was right. The, this about. this is what was proposed as phase one. So this this entire structure is the phase one building, which includes 38 units. So that's that's the, the design has not changed since we showed it to council and the housing authority boards last month. And and what what is, is that? Part of the, of the residences? Is yes, that, yes, uh, it would be. So um, I don't have the phase two um, slide with me, but the idea was that this is phase one, and then when phase two happens, the actual two buildings connect to one another. This provides an opportunity for community space in the building, as well as additional units, and a way to connect to a phase two project. Although, 
that this does not guarantee phase two and as my understanding is while while there are plans for phase two once we get to that point we, we may evaluate whether it's better to you know um, re, re, you know Rehab the existing building, build a new building, what have you. I mean, those those decisions haven't been made. Right. Is that correct? Fa phase one could be a standalone Level, project, right. yeah. okay. um, depending on funding availability and design work for phase two. Okay. Yes. Let, let me come to council and see if there are any other questions. You, I was just going to ask if you want to ask Mr. Nestor about the zoning question. Yeah. Or, well, well, I, yeah. I, okay. I could actually answer okay. that. I could yes. answer. Um, based on the timing of the applications, as I mentioned, the CDBG application will be submitting at the end of this month. We typically know in the June time frame um, whether or not we've been um, awarded funding for that. Um, as of last week, we just learned that the HUD 202 notices for funding availability have been released, and so uh, those are due June 1st, so they're kind of back-to-back -back for one another. I would anticipate, based on those two funding sources and their, their, their deadlines, that we would start any rezoning process probably this summer. Um, and a lot of that's going to depend on some of the requirements for CDBG as well as HUD 202 um, for how we fund the projects and make the projects work. So I would anticipate our work starting the summer on that. So, and may I ask a follow-up mm -hmm. question on that? The, any rezoning that might be necessary would be specific to this particular parcel? It would be for phase one, yes. And. However we progress, the property is still owned by the Housing and Redevelopment Authority. So if there's a change in plan, it's not like the property all of a sudden becomes available on the open market for somebody to develop it differently. Right, exactly. The, the relationship and partnership that we've been uh, working with, with Peninsula Agency and Aging as well as Bay Aging, looks at a long-term land lease where the property is still owned and maintained by the Housing Authority, um, but um, uh, the project itself could be constructed and managed by another nonprofit group. So if uh, all those things are contingent upon us getting these, the project funded and being able to move it forward, if we're not able to do that, then the property continues to remain the Housing Authority's uh, property and they continue to manage and maintain the current blatant building. And in that process, will the Housing Authority need to come back to Council for any reason? Aside from the, once the rezoning, again, if it's necessary, once the rezoning is complete uh, in order to move through the various phases of the project? I guess the point is, will there be opportunity for public input? Yes, yes, okay. it, there would be. This is just a CDB app, CDBG right. application, which requires a public hearing. Any additional funding, like a HUD 202, is going to require not only a public hearing at the council level, but additional neighborhood meetings and residence meetings to, for, to receive input. So there would be many opportunities between now and a project moving forward, either a phase one <coughs> or a phase two, for additional input. So it looks like the CDBG funding timeline is slightly ahead of the HUD 202 yes. timeline. Yes. So if the CDBG grant application is unsuccessful, then at that point we withdraw from the HUD 202 or do we continue to pursue that? Um, my recommendation was that we would continue to pursue the 202 because that money allows us to do design and construction work of a building. We would then have to reevaluate, as I mentioned, what the CDBG would be paying for. And really those are site improvements and utility work that needs to be done in order to make a project like this work. So if one of those two streams does not come through, are the resources available to make this happen anyway? No. So we really do need both. Yes. Is there any downside to going through the process, being awarded one of the two, and then not following through because the other stream doesn't come, come about? I mean, is there, do we, as a community, be look, are we looked at unfavorably for future requests because... No, actually, no I, I don't think so. I think we're actually looked upon favorably by trying to apply for this additional money because it can be used as leverage for the application, but it also shows that not only the Housing Authority and the City are committed, but we're also willing to bring additional CDBG dollars or 202 dollars to the project. So those things tend to be looked upon favorably when you put together projects like this and of, of, of the size and cost. And to Ms. Klein's point about the preference for keeping people at home or allowing them to age in place, can you remind us what the current wait list 
uh, situation is for the Blayton building? Sure. Um, well, we, it's, uh, the current waiting list that the Housing Authority has for public housing is, is over 300. And they've actually had to stop taking people on the waiting list be, um, just because by the time you process people and, and they get through the system, there's a few number of years out before they're even eligible to be on the waiting list. Um, so based on that number, what we see coming through as far as um, residents who qualify to live in the Blayton building, we know that that waiting list will continue to grow. Thank you. Scott, do you have any questions? Yeah. The, the waiting list uh, of 300 people, those are uh, city residents, James City County residents, both of them, right? Right. It's right. not they, city specific. It's not city specific. Gotcha. The, as we go through this, the funding request, um, and we got two phases of building, does the funding cover both phases of the construction or just the first phase? Just phase one. Right. And so yes. sometime in the future, we would have to reapply to find we would. someone. We would, exactly. I would anticipate if we're successful with this round of funding for phase one, re, uh, applying for phase two project funding in two to three years. So the, the existing building, which we've described as being, you know, hitting its life cycle, could probably be there at least another three, yes. three to four years. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Do you, do you. I haven't got a question, but I, I did want to say something about Ms. Klein's question about, um, I think that most people in the field agree that staying at home is the best way to age. Aging in place is the best thing to do. The reality is that there are people in our community who cannot do that for various reasons. They, they simply cannot do that. They cannot live alone. There are very few visiting nurse programs. There are very few home health programs, and they are very, very expensive. So this is actually the best alternative for a lot of our citizens, and I think the size of the waiting list shows you that. So. I do have one quick question. Yeah. Um, these grants, do they specifically apply to, you know, brick and mortar buildings? Because there's going to be a significant, I mean, it looks like to me there's going to be a significant expense on landscaping uh, paths, trees, and whatnot. Uh, um, different grants guidelines allow you to use grant money in different ways. Okay. So for CDBG money, um, what they would allow us to use money for for this type of project are, are things outside of bricks and mortar. Are, there are the utility work that needs to be done and relocation on the site, uh, additional site work, landscaping, additional lighting, um, the retention pond that I mentioned. Those are the things for this type of project would qualify for CDBG. Very good. Um, HUD 202 funding is more your bricks and mortar type of funding stream where they allow for design and actual construction of a new facility. In addition to that, they provide longer term funding for maintenance and operation of a facility like we're talking about. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else just, have just a, a real, Along these lines, th we have other facilities, New Hope Road and Mimosa. Um, how, do, how do those buildings, how are they in terms of age? Are they very probably pretty old as well, aren't they? Um, I, I, I'm not, I can't speak to that, Andy. I don't know. The, Mr. Don't know. Hungerman is the director of the Housing Authority. He can speak to the, if, if you could come to the mic, please, so that people can, at home uh, can see, see and hear you. Um, but I think a Andy will talk about the, the various stimulus money and other money right. that's been used in the last few years to upgrade. Good uh, cue. <laughs> Actually, um, the goal that we had when we accepted the funding for, for from the ARR <laughs> stimulus grant, which was not as much as we would like to have, would like to have a lot more, but we took that $225,000 and our goal was to approach those facilities um, to do things that would protect the envelope of the building, roofs. Uh, we got a lot of help from the Baltimore HUD uh, engineering staff and extend the life of, of those houses. And um, it's worked pretty well. We, uh, we will continue to do that um, because we have uh, capital funds that we receive from the Housing Authority each year, and we do what's called a five-year plan, and on that plan we iterate the most, uh, the highest priority items <coughs> down a list for a five-year period, and then hope we get enough of uh, the uh, funding to carry us forward. So the objective, no matter what we have, we have to keep it according to HUD standards, 
prepared for inspections and to make sure we're doing the right thing to provide uh, safe, sanitary, and decent housing for our residents. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Honorman. Okay. You're welcome. One, one final point. I, would, I, would, I appreciate Mrs. Klein's comments, and, and again, I think, uh, uh, as, as Judy suggested, aging in place is, is, is preferable, and the city actually ha has a number of programs to try to, to help that. But the need is is very great, and and so I think it's not one or the other, but it's really sort of proceeding in a, along both paths and seeing uh, you know how we can best serve the needs of the individuals. And and currently, our human services staff works closely with the right. housing authority right. to to um, provide needed services for for residents at the Blayton Building. So I would see that that partnership continue in the future, as well as expanding it based on our other partners on our project team. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll come to council for action. Oh, Mr. Mayor, unless there's uh, other no, discussion. Any, any no. further discussion? I'm... I move that uh, City Council approve proposed resolution 11-01, authorizing the city manager to submit a CDBG application in the amount of $472,710 for phase one of the Blayton Site Housing Production Project. I have a motion and a second. Would you call the roll, please, Ms. Scott? Ms. Newton? Aye. Mr. Pons? Aye. Mayor Holman? Aye. Mr. Farley? Aye. Mr. Foster? Aye. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Thank you. Um, the second uh, public hearing today is uh, PCR 11-002 to amend the text of the zoning ordinance to revise provisions relating to Chesapeake Bay preservation for site plans. This is proposed ordinance 11-04. And I see Ms. Murphy is going yeah. to give us information. Mayor Hallman and members of council, at the February City Council work session, I gave an overview of the Chesapeake Bay regulations. I noted that our ordinance needs some minor changes to meet Ches Bay requirements. Before you today is the ordinance that meets the minor changes to meet those requirements. The changes necessary are in the site plan section of the zoning ordinance for minor site plans and regular site plans. Uh, the minor site plan section basically needs these three things, the building restriction line and required setbacks, the landscape plan section to include the canopy and dimensions and other woody vegetations with the groups of five or more being shown as outlined around the perimeter, and the third one is for the resource protection area to include that notation on the plan about the existing vegetation. <coughs> the regular site plan section has the location of the resource protection areas and the RP and RMA's resource management areas and also the canopy uh, dimensions and sizes being shown in that section. Planning Commission reviewed the request in February and recommended approval of the proposed ordinance 11-4 to City Council by a vote of 5-0. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Let me see if there are any questions before we go to the public hearing. Anybody? Any questions? Thank you, Ms. Murray. I'll now open the public hearing. Anyone with, who wishes to speak, uh, may please come forward. If you do, please state your name and address. It doesn't appear that anyone wishes to, to speak. Uh, I'll close the public hearing and come back to council for any comments and action. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, I'd like to move the approval of proposed ordinance 11-04. Second. I have a motion and a second. Uh, Ms. Scott, would you call the roll, please? Ms. Newton? Aye. Mr. Pond? Aye. Mayor Holman? Aye. Mr. Farley? Aye. Mr. Foster? Aye. Our third public hearing today is to add the Village of Woodshire Apartments to the Rental Inspection Program Proposed Ordinance 11-05. And Mr. Nestor is going to brief us on this. First, I'd like to say a few words about our rental inspection program. That was adopted by the city in 2004. The regulations apply in four designated uh, rental inspection districts in the city. But in addition, the regulations allow rental dwelling units located outside of these districts to be subject to the regulations if council makes a separate finding that there is a need to protect public health, welfare, and safety of the occupants 
of that individual rental dwelling unit to the individual rental dwelling unit is either blighted or in the process of deteriorating, or three, there is evidence of violations of the building code that affect the safe, decent, and sanitary living conditions for occupants of such individual residential rental dwelling unit. And this includes, that definition includes an apartment complex like we have throughout uh, the city. The Codes Compliance Division is concerned about the village of Woodshire located on Merrimack Trail, which you see uh, on the top of the screen. This is a 288 unit apartment complex that was built in 1975. And the concern is based on the increasing number of complaints and inspections in the past five years, as you can see, are illustrated on the chart in blue are the complaints that we've received from 2006 through 2010, and in red are the number of inspections we've had uh, in those years. The Code's compliance staff feels that in order to protect the public health, safety, and welfare of the occupants, the entire village of Woodshire complex should be made subject to the rental inspection program. Uh, Stanley Skinner, our Codes Compliance Director, and myself uh, met with the regional manager of Great Atlantic Management that's in charge of this complex, uh, Elizabeth Bouvier, and she is here and has some comments to make at the public hearing. We talked with her uh, last week, and you, they have filed a request for a six month extension of council's uh, decision. Uh, <clears throat> and that had some uh, information on our things they have done and things they plan to do. The <coughs> main reason that they cited for the uptick in complaints was substantial storm damage during 2010. And indeed, there was a big uptick in 2010. Uh, however, as you can see from the chart, there's been a consistent increase in complaints in the four years prior to 2010, and the number of complaints received have been substantially more than the other apartment complexes on Merrimack Trail, a total of 132 in this case versus 11 complaints for the other three apartment complexes over the same time period. Uh, nonetheless, staff would accept a six-month deferral of the council decision, but we would note the following. The complaint record without the storm event in 2010 provides enough evidence to recommend inclusion in the rental inspection program. There is no normal range of complaints that are acceptable to the city. The desired level of complaints, of course, is no complaints. And the complaint record, even without the storm event, is substantially above the other apartment complexes in the city. So those are the comments I have to make. Uh, as I mentioned, the regional manager for Great Atlantic is present, as is Stanley Skinner, if you have some specific code-related questions of him. Great. Thank you, Reed. Does anyone have any questions for Reed at this point? Before I... Not right at this moment. No. Okay. If, if not, I'll open the public hearing and ask anyone who wishes to speak to the issue to please come forward, state your name and address. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, City Council members. My name is Elizabeth Bouvier, and I'm the regional property manager for Great Atlantic Management overseeing the Village of Wichire Apartments located at 159 Merrimack Trail. Um, <clears throat> we, we too realize that the ideal number of complaints is zero um, and we are, um, what we'd like to do is ask for a six month um, deference for the ordinance to be, um, uh, to be approved to give us an opportunity to uh, show that we can get much closer to the number of zero complaints. Um, <clears throat> what I have, um, in addition to my request, is a spreadsheet 
that I'd like to share with Council. Oh, yeah. If you please give it to Miss Scott and she can pass it to us. <coughs> And basically what this summarizes is um, <clears throat> not only what we've done in the past, um, but what we did specifically in 2010 and what we plan on doing moving forward. Um, the property underwent a, over $2 million renovation in 2008 um, to um, update the property as well as, you know, keep it in compliance with the, with the codes. Um, in 2010, there was... Um, the Nor November Nor'easter that created substantial damage in one particular building that did affect um, <clears throat> 12 apartments. Um, and that was also a, a roof issue, so it affected the roof of, of, the, of the building and essentially everybody in it. Um, we have um, taken measures to completely um, <clears throat> remedy all of the damage that was done by the storm. Um, and we're taking ongoing measures for the water issues that were also a, a part of the complaints in 2010 um, that had to do with um, water or sewer lines. Um, we're doing a regular jetting of the lines, the sewer lines and the water lines to keep them clear um, so that we can prevent those backups from happening. Um, <clears throat> in addition, um, we're moving forward with a, uh, a lighting upgrade. We're going to partner with the local um, police to make sure that they are um, giving us good advice for um, the lighting issues that exist on the property, continuing with our exterminating, um, repairing and replacing heating and air conditioning units, and um, ongoing um, general inspections just to make sure that the property is kept up to code. Um, so, so with that, we'd like to ask for an opportunity to show that we can fall as close to the zero number of complaints as possible. Um, and, you know, on behalf of Great Atlantic Management and the Village of Woodshire, um, you know, I'd like to um, ask for that so that we can show you that we, we are able to do it. Great. Thank, thank you very much. Does anybody else wish to speak? Good afternoon. I'm John Whitley. I live at 110 Governor Berkeley Road in Skipwith Farms. I'm not representing any group, organization, business, or etc. I know this ordinance is extremely complicated and not expansive uh, at all. I'm really the rental inspection program. Um, However, as I look at it, it appears to be more of a corrective than a preventive approach. I'd like to think that somewhere in this arena there is something that could be called a landlord accountability uh, to see how something that has the teeth and the strength of a rental inspection program could be applied to other areas in the city. Uh, for example, where I live in Skipwith Farms as a subdivision. Um, oft times tenants only route of redress is attempting to go through a rental agent in a given real estate property sometimes with resolve sometimes with not with the alternative being if you're not happy leave oft times there are properties that appear not attended as as well as they should be that are rental properties and the persons to look at are not necessarily the tenants, but those who own the property, the landlords. I think about the discussions that helped create the Neighborhood Relations Council as it dealt with health and safety issues of housing that students occupy. Uh, I'm, I'm being extremely simplistic because, uh, frankly, all of the, the workings of this uh, rental inspection program, uh, I'm not that uh, adept in discussing. However, conceptually, it appears to be a vehicle that could help us as a city move the one group that needs moved often, often toward accountability, and that's the landlords. So if there's any way 
that's something that this, the rental inspection, inspection program, can be overlaid a subdivision, uh, we'd like to at some point engage in that type of discussion with whomever in, in city employee that we best discuss that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Whitley. Any, anybody else wish to speak? <clears throat> if not, I'll close the public hearing and come back to council for any uh, questions, comments. Thank Action. you. <laughs> May I ask Mr. Nestor a few questions? Can you help me appreciate what the numbers mean on the chart where in 2010 the number of complaints seemed to spike significantly to 70 and the number of follow-up <coughs> inspections to 199? When an individual has a, a concern about their particular living situation and they contact codes compliance or whatever area of the city they might happen to reach first, are there multiple complaints that can come out of one call, or is one call one complaint? I think probably Mr. Skinner, who is involved in running the problem, would be the person to address okay. the question rather than so. <coughs> Don't go too far, though, Mr. Master. <laughs> Don't worry. There are times when if we go out for one complaint, and if we notice other complaints within the structure, then that will constitute other complaints. So, if, for instance, if someone calls in and they're stating that they're having sewer backup, but then we go in and we notice that there are some electrical problems, then that could constitute another complaint, which means that we, we go in and we may have to get one complaint taken care of right now. Then the other complaint, it may require them to have a little bit more time, so then that's how the turnaround, we may have to go back several times in order to, and sometimes we go back and it's just not ready, or it's not, it hasn't been brought completely up to code, which means then we will have to go back and do another follow-up inspection, and it becomes very time-consuming. So it's possible that one initial complaint could result in three or five issues in a particular living space. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. So 70 complaints does not mean there were 70 units that had problems? No, not necessarily 70 units. Um, did you know, do you happen to know off the top of your head, was there a, a significant uptick in the number of issues or complaints that came about in the end of the year? following this November storm? Well, no, because the storm only affected one one unit or one group of apartments. There were 12 apartments within that unit, and then we had the roof caved in, and then so we had to condemn some of the units and move some of the people, well, they moved some of the people in other units, or some of them, you know, just moved in other units. But that was just one isolated incident. But we still, you know, in the other units, we've, we've been having problems, and we've been having people call in complaining about certain living conditions. So, yes, we had a spike for, for that particular time. But number was already high. Even yes, the number the was, it was already high. Um, did any, I'm just curious, um, were, were there conversations, I'm sure there are conversations with the people. Uh, is it possible for you to give us uh, a general feeling of what you've heard from the residents through these investigations and follow-up inspections? Well, basically the residents, when, when any residents, and if they call the office, they're calling, there's an emotional part that comes in because they're having problems. So that part comes in, and they pretty much all basically the same. I have a problem, I've talked to management, and we can't verify whether or not someone has or has not talk, spoken to management. Our job is to go in and make sure that if there is a code violation, it's our job to send a notice to make sure that the matter is taken care of. And how would you gauge the responsiveness or the timeliness of response of the landlord to these issues as they've been brought to the landlord's attention? Well, when we send notices of violation and we give them uh, X amount of days to correct the problems, normally the problem is corrected. I don't think we've had any court cases that we've had to take them to court, which means that they have come into compliance. Okay. Um, and I'll leave it to you or to Mr. Nestor on this next one. Um, okay. The 10% uh, which is the number or the percentage of units that could be inspected if the uh, rental inspection uh, designation is placed on this area. 
Is that a random 10% of the units? How, yes, how, how, okay. Mm -hmm. and, and then if those inspections are undertaken and you see state building code issues, then you have the discretion to inspect as many more units as you care to do. If we run into issues where the 10% and then we notice that there's a spike in other problems within that community or the, the rental district for, in reference to those the par apartments, then we can request that we go in and, and, and inspect uh, the other units as well. And so we wouldn't just be limited to the 10% if there's a spike. Say, for instance, the first year we don't have any issues. And then a year or so after that, we notice that these, the units, the number of inspections starts to rise. Then we can actually uh, add additional units to that. Okay. And again, this question could be for either of you. What does the six months really help us achieve? I think what the six months, it gives them an opportunity, gives the owners an opportunity to see if they can come into, come into compliance and keep the like Mr. Nestor stated, we don't have a set number of how many violations we would like to have. Zero is, is the ultimate number, but, you know, to get zero, I'm not sure that can happen. But this will give them an opportunity and put them on notice to say, look, we have, you have six months. And that's, within that time, we continue to see the problem, then we're going to, you know, put you into the program. If not, then, then council can take it upon you know, to do whatever council sees fit in reference to that. And this seems like an obvious question, but I feel compelled to ask anyway. If a tenant has an issue with their living circumstances, their rental, uh, pro the property that they occupy, they certainly have the opportunity to go to the management company and address the matter there. And if that matter is corrected at that point, it never gets to you. That's is that true. correct? Mm -hmm. So these 70 complaints are either people who decided that that wasn't a direction they wanted to go, and they may have come straight to the city, or they could have gone to the management company and not received satisfaction, and then come to the city. But we don't have any way of knowing that? Okay. Thank you. Scott, <laughs> to the best of your ability, what, give, give me some sort of estimate on the number of these complaints and follow-ups are the result of long-term neglect or one event causing a number of complaints? No, it's not just one event. I mean, it's, it's for the whole 2010. So we didn't just have one event that caused uh, all the inspections to go up. Sure, there was an isolated incident when the roof collapsed and we had to, you know, condemn 12 units at one time. That's normally that's not the norm. So that particular incident it, we spike with inspections and follow-ups, but it's been a pattern. And, and as you can see from the chart, that we've been kind of steadily climbing in the wrong direction, and we want it to go in the other direction. Gotcha. Which, what's your understanding of how the amount of, amount of your man hours will be affected by putting this complex into this program versus what's been happening up until to this point. Do you think, you know, preventative maintenance will, you know, with being in the program will be beneficial or, I mean, as far as that goes? Well, if I understand your question correctly, of course the, the, the man hours will go up because uh, the, rental, the rental program, every four years we have to do a, there's a second round of inspections that we have to do. So the initial part, man hours will go up, and then in that four years, again, when we have to do the other cycle of inspections, it will go up. But the ultimate goal that we're trying to achieve is compliance. And we want to make sure that the, the citizens within the city of Williamsburg are taken, taken care of. You know, if we can get compliance, you know, with the rental, inspection program, then, you know, that's the route that we, you know, that we may have to take. But ultimately, we want to make sure that the citizens are taken care of and they feel that we're behind them and that we are here to do a job. Very good. Thank you. Any, any, no? Do you have a sense of, of how many of these 70s that uh, complaints are reported here in 2010, these are all founded Cam complaints. Yes, sir. Were you called out on occasions and found some complaints to be unfounded? Yes, sir. Sometimes um, we have been called out and there weren't, you know, we didn't feel that there was a complaint. I mean, but 
Normally when people call us, there's an issue. Sure. And, and they're not just going to call just for the sake of calling because they have to take time off from work and it just caused a problem. So normally when they call us, there, there's an issue sure. and there's a reason that, that they're calling. Sure. And there's, you know, so. And, and maybe you can't answer the question, um, but do you, do you have a sense that some of the complaints were, were were derived or came to you because they they didn't feel like management was addressing them soon enough, or maybe management was was non-existent at the property, and so you were the last recourse. Uh, was there a breakdown between the tenants and the, and the management? Do you think at all? Well, when we go out to do the inspections, we don't get into that aspect of it with the inspectors and, and what I tell them when and when you go to the structure and make an inspection just deal with the facts mm -hmm. because emotions are flying high and sometimes you if you let your emotions get involved you say things that you normally probably shouldn't and wouldn't say so I just tell them stick with the facts if there's a violation there then we should be there if it's not a violation then we shouldn't be there and that's pretty much how, how we try to operate Okay, thank you for that. You, but your sense to date is that the the owners and management company have been addressing the complaints as they've been brought to you in, in, a, in a pretty ex, expeditious way. Yes, they, they have been addressing because if they, you know, normally if they don't address, then we have to go to the court through the court systems, and we have not had to do that. Okay, thank you. Do you need to have anybody else? Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Any further discussion? I'll make a comment. <laughs> okay. um, I, th I think the fact that, uh, well, from what Mr. Skinner said, the storm clearly created some issues for the complex, but those aren't really all of the issues that we're dealing with here. The problem is bigger and therefore longer term than that one event might have if you pardon the word, precipitated. The, um, I guess the, the bigger concern I have is that in the sheet that was given to us, that's after the $2.2 .2 million was put into the apartment complex in 2007 and eight, which at least one and a half million is going directly to interior improvements in the uh, apartments themselves. And that's, that causes me some serious concern. I'm not sure that even if we went six months and didn't, didn't have a complaint, that that would demonstrate all of a sudden that everything was just as it should be in the complex. But with that said, if the six-month period provides greater incentive to the management company to do whatever they can do to improve the circumstances in all of the apartments, then I think that's a good incentive for them to have. Yeah, and, and I agree with you. I, th I think you know, what, what we want to do is not have to have the city be involved here. If, if, the, if the property owner uh, will take care of issues as they arise, and apparently they, they do, and, but, uh, and do the preventive maintenance and, and cut down the number of complaints without us getting directly involved, that seems to me to be the kind of outcome we would like to have. Um, I'm, I'm I worry whether six months is enough time to, to tell us that or not, but I think uh, from my perspective, I would be willing to give them six months to see. Uh, we, we will be watching closely if, if, if as I hope, um, the number of complaints drops dramatically, uh, and I think we, we will have gotten to where we want to be. Well, if I understand Mr. Skinner, uh, there's no magic to the six-month period, right. if at any point after this, That's it right. appears that there's a need you for uh, this sort of uh, rental inspection program in, in the complex area, then that's certainly within the prerogative of the council. I, I would have to agree. Having walked this neighborhood last spring, there were a significant number of comments about this, and it was visually apparent to me. Uh, we, six months can go very well, but this is evidence of long-term dereliction. It's not just an isolated event. Uh, I, I understand the merits of awarding the six months, but I would appreciate some, you know, continual attention to this following, as Mr. Frolic said. So. Well, uh, just to follow, you know, I think this 
what a rental inspection district would do would, would help protect the health, safety, and welfare of the tenants there. And that's, that's what the ordinance um, is designed to do. Um, I, I would like to see us give them six months um, because, it, it, A, I think it was a rather dramatic spike in 2010. I think we could easily see a dramatic spike downwards in 2011, uh, and I hope that be the case. Um, it sounds to me that the owners and management are, are uh, committed to, to resolving some of those issues, which I think can be, you know, be generated in lots of different ways. And, and relationships between tenants and, and the management company, I think, will probably speak volumes to that. Um, and then, and if we could get out of having to, and that may be the wrong choice of words, but if we could not put them in the rental inspection, I think it would save. You know, the city staff a huge amount of resources uh, that they would have to expend otherwise, and um, and I think for the for most counts, um, uh, the, the apartment's been been run fairly well. You know, looking at the complaints, except we've we've got a bad bad blip here. So I hope they can fix it in six months, and we can all move on. Um, someone mentioned the money spent in 2007, 2008, but if you look at the spreadsheet provided by the, the management company, what they did in 2007, 2008 is quite different from what they're planning in the 2010. So it, it looks to me as though it's a different set of problems in some ways. So, um, so I, I too am in favor of the six-month extension. I hope it works. Uh, and if, I, if I may. Um, but the amount that they're looking at, and it's not all about money. No, I mean, no, you no. Know, fixing things is important, yeah. and so it takes money to do that. But but the amount of investment, yeah, in mean, the 2010 recommendation and is, and even 2011 is, just it's comparatively very small to what's already been spent, and we still have the issues. I think Mr. Pons touched on something that I'd like to amplify, if I may, the importance of the communication between the management company and the residents. Uh, is, is critical to this because anybody can have a problem in the place that they happen to be living in. It's whether or not that problem is resolved quickly and effectively and to serve the needs of the tenant because when that does not happen, then people feel as though they've lost a sense of trust and they don't have another way to go. So building that communication and that uh, cooperation to me is probably the biggest single thing that can be done beyond the financial investment because let the property manager get in here and fix these things as they arise, as they will be. I mean, I can, it's been a long time since I lived at the Villages of Woodshire, and so we know it's been there for a long time. And I, I, I think, you know, this is certainly a, a warning light for the city and a warning light for the, for the management of, of the, the complex. And um, I think I'm, I'm in favor of giving them time to see if they can turn that warning light out in six months. And, and if not, then I think we come back and address the issue of, of the rental inspection district. That's it. Would anybody like to Mr. Make a Mayor, I move to postpone further discussion of ordinance number 11-05 until the October 13th, 2011 City Council meeting. Second. I have a motion and a second. Ms. Scott, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Aye. Mr. Pond. Aye. Aye. Mr. Farley. Aye. Mr. Foster. Aye. Thank you. Our next order of business is reports. Uh, first is the monthly financial statements. Uh, Mr. Tuttle. Can you Just a few things to point out. Uh, we're now two thirds of the way through the fiscal year, and if you look on the first page, it's it is uh, apparent that we're running very, very close in terms of actual revenues and expenditures to where we were at this same time last year. We're just a little ahead on revenues by about a percent, yeah. a percentage point, and expenditures are just about dead on level. So um, that, that is the picture we have now. We're, we're not making great gains, but uh, at least we're not slipping back any further this year uh, compared to last year. That's just an, in an overall sense. You can look at the revenues that some are up and some are down, both compared to where we were last year at this time and also relative to budget. Uh, I point out on page five the, uh, the numbers for uh, January room tax uh, show a, uh, a decline of 5%. I understand from the finance director that 
some payments came in just beyond the, the last date that will reflect and that number will come up somewhat uh, when you see the report next month. So it's uh, <coughs> otherwise, uh, even though January is always a <coughs> considerably lower month than, than, uh, than the rest of the year, uh, it's, it doesn't appear that it's going to be negative uh, when we get all the information in. So you, we're going to have a positive trend for January, is that what you say? That's what, yes. I, I have, what, it's not going to be this number. I know it's going to be better, and I hope it gets to the positive ter territory. I don't have the final number on that. Anybody have any questions for Mr. Tuttle on the financial reports? Just an observation. I see we're, we're, we are two-tenths of a percent on our, our money in the bank. <laughs> That may be going up. <laughs> Can't go much lower. Yeah. If not, uh, monthly department operating reports. I have nothing in particular to point out. Happy to answer any questions. Does anyone have any questions for city manager on operating reports? We have two new businesses. Uh, it would be nice to hear those names mentioned publicly. Mich Michelle, Michelle, too. You have those? Yeah, if you could. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of council. We did have two business licenses obtained last month in February, and they were Body Fit, which is a personal training center, and um, CC's Pizza, which um, will be up near Inflation Nation in the Patriot Plaza um, shopping center. Will open any minute, I'm sure. <laughs> It's open. Randy says it's open. <laughs> Ta-da! <laughs> you work miracles, Michelle. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Does it, anybody else have any questions? Maybe me? just just a question, and I hate to put the police department on on, on the spot, but it looks to be like a, a about a twenty five percent increase in calls for service, um, but I don't know that they necessarily translate down into the rest of the chart. Maybe help me understand. What's going on there? Certainly. We had uh, 340 calls for service in house checks, more than we did in the previous month. And uh, traffic stops are up, uh, 250. And um, I have uh, calls for service up in suspicious vehicles, and that's directly related to the uh, previous burglary investigations that we had going. And um, we are also engaging in a um, more accurate count of our calls for service than previously is like when our uh, response time analysis and so uh, that along with a uh, manpower allocation that I've been working on um, actually requiring officers to uh, maintain more accurate accounting for their time has actually uh, resulted in this increase in numbers that we have here. Now, is some of that the result of, of uh, people being away and asking the police to keep a, a watch on their home? So is, is that seasonalness to some extent? Or, or? Uh, it can be. Um, whenever you're looking at 340, that doesn't necessarily mean 340 residences because we check them multiple times <laughs> during the day. Um, but during this time of the season, it is often uh, when people do leave and they come back. Anybody else have any questions? Thank, Thank you very you. much. Appreciate it. Though. Appreciate the answer. Anybody else have questions on operating reports? If not, uh, the next order of business is city manager reports, and we have uh, information about budget work sessions. Mr. Tuttle. Uh, yes, you have the schedule for our budget work, se work sessions, which will start on the. Uh, let me get to the page here. which will start on the 21st, Monday evening at 5 p.m. We're, we're, going, we're going to be meeting in the Quarter Path uh, Multipurpose Room, Quarter Path Recreation Center, while the third floor is being renovated in the municipal building. So uh, Monday night and Tuesday night for budget, budget work sessions. At the uh, work session in April, we'll have uh, the school's uh, 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 presentation of their budget. And also, that will be the time of the public hearing on the council's budget will be the April council meeting a month from uh, this meeting. 
anybody have any questions for Mr. Tuttle? So, so the dates for people who are interested in the budget process are, are the two work sessions in uh, uh, March 21st and 22nd, starting at 5 p.m. at the Quarter Path Recreation Center. Correct. Then the work session in April, and that's Monday the, the 11th, 11th at, 7 at 7 p.m. here in the Stryker Building, and that's when the school board and school administration will be here to present the school's budget. And then that following Thursday will be the public hearing on, on the budget for city council. That's correct. Okay, so those four dates. Anybody else have any comments or questions about the budget process? <laughs> The timing of the budget process. I think we all have questions about the budget. Yeah. <laughs> so you may have just told me, but I, I didn't catch it. When do you uh, release your proposed budget? Yeah, we'll go out a week from tomorrow. Okay. So Friday, Friday the 18th. Right. Thank you. And that will be put on the city's website as well as distributed on our iPads. And yes. Yes, it will. Okay. Great. Okay. Any further questions? I do have a question. Yep. You made me think of that. That means we won't get the gigantic binder this year? You're going to get a small amount of paper. Okay. Just to make it a little more convenient, we're going to take a little bit of the, some of the summary information and give it to you, but most of the big binder is going to be on the iPad. Okay. Thank you. Add up those savings of paper, right? <laughs> okay. Um, our next order of business is city attorney reports. Uh, this is housekeeping. Every year the City Council adopts the supplement to the electronic version of the City Code. That would be supplement number 23, which includes all of the ordinances passed in 2010. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about this? This is housekeeping, as you said. Mr. Mayor, I move that City Council adopt proposed, or, proposed ordinance 11-03, Williamsburg City Code supplement number 23, January 2011. Second. I have a motion and a second. Would you call the roll, please, Ms. Scott? Ms. Nixon. Aye. Mr. Pons. Aye. Mr. Aye. Mr. Aye. Mr. Foster. Aye. Our next order of business is the schedule of meetings. Jack, is there anything in particular? Nothing in particular to point out other than what we just did. Okay. Anybody have any questions about the calendar? Uh, I take it there's no unfinished business. Uh, Oh. Uh, is this where I can bring up some? Yep. yep. <laughs> or, or under new business. Under new business. Know, okay. Which will be next. All right. Anyway. Well, um, <laughs> take another breath and then we'll be right back. Okay. I'll take no unfinished Sorry. business. Uh, now, new business. Thank you, Mr. Pond. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, last, uh, a few weeks ago, we met with in a joint session with James City County Supervisors and the school board. Um, and, and I was glad to have had the opportunity to sit and listen to, to the discussion. I think a lot of it was very productive. Um, one of the things on the agenda was kind of the this report card on how well our students are doing, and um, and maybe it was just me, but I don't know that we really got much of an assessment of, of how the students are doing. Um, and I, I heard some statistics recently. I, I visited the All Academy and, and heard some statistics, and which got me thinking about um, how well are our students doing in the division as a, as a whole. Um, amongst all the demographics. Um, and then beyond that, I wonder if, if there isn't a way that we can understand how, those, how the demographics of the school division marry up with the demographics of the city proper um, and then look at you know, graduation rates and you know, just general success rates of city students. Um, and I, I, there's probably no answer I can have today. Uh, but would like to put that on the table to see if we can't get uh, some understanding of how well the city students are performing uh, relative to the division and, and maybe some of the surrounding communities. Yeah. And that, th those are questions that have been asked before. Um, I'm hoping that we, with a new school administrator, we will get answers to those. But I think, uh, and I think uh, I took the message from our joint meeting pretty clearly that. Uh, the, the type of data we've been provided was not really sufficient for what we want. But I think that's a continued conversation we, we need to have with both the city representatives on the school board and with the school administration. But I think it speaks to a more fundamental question, which is what are the true measurements of success? And there doesn't seem to be complete agreement on that. 
there are, there are there are multiple measures and there are disagreements about many many of them but it seems to me that that the the wider range of information we have the, the better we can can try to assess what's going on but there certainly is um, a lot of, of discussion and controversy about the various measures so and I, and I appreciate the discussion um, you know how, how do we how do we put that on on the officially put it on the docket so that maybe we can get some of the answers um, and, and I, I hear that we'll have to talk to our, our school board reps but um, is there you know can we make it an agenda item to get these responses brought to us in, in particular I, I would like to I would be interested to see them prior to the budget discussion with the school so we have time to you know well, well Ms. yeah I was just going to say I, I the the past we've wanted to use some of these as outcome measures under our goals and initiatives program we've been unable to get the data broken down city and county in order so we had a measurement of, of, of city children um, so I think that the place to start is perhaps to indicate the measures that we would like to see that for because I believe they're going to have to go through uh, it's not a matter of simply pulling it out of the system they're, they're going to have to go back and do specific coding, and it may be quite involved. I don't know, but I think the more specific we are about the measures we'd like to see. I know the one that we put in that we, we would, in the goals and initiatives and outcomes we'd like to have is third grade reading achievement. That seems to be a metric that a lot of people agree is a very good indicator of outcomes. But if we knew that, then we'd go back to the schools and say these are the ones, because I believe it's going to take them a good deal of effort to pull it out. I mean, clearly we know how many students we, we enroll in the school. That we know. Right, and, and, and we probably have some understanding of the demographics of, uh, in general, of, of the city of Waynesburg, you know, income levels. I know we've done surveys. And maybe there's some element of extrapolation that can be done, uh, you know, on our part internally. Once, you know, looking at graduation rates, for example, of, of minority students, in the district and, and as a whole, and then how that relates to what we think we know of the demographics of Williamsburg. Well, the, the first, the, dem the demographics of Williamsburg we have. The problem is it, we have graduation rates and quite a bit of information on that for the school system. It's separating out the city and the county children on all of those metrics, which isn't done. So that's where the work has to occur. Okay. I mean, that's there, that, as I understand it from past discussions is, that they don't in in their in their data entry systems they don't differentiate from among students by where the students come from they they consider them students in the school system and they're part of their information system whether that coding could be done how expensive it might be are, are all issues but certainly um, we have for a number of years been suggesting that better information about the performance of city children would be helpful to us um, getting it is, is, is a well, challenge. No if we can elevate it to a priority, I'd, I'd appreciate it, and, and to whatever that means or whoever does it. So. Sorry, I'm trying to think about whether or not I want to comment. Um, I'm not a database administrator. My guess is this information exists in the database, and there are many different ways to manipulate data if one is willing to go to the effort to set up the right level of coding or tagging or whatever you want to call it on any individual record, which could still be done and maintain individuals' privacy. So we know, as Mr. Pons pointed out, how many students are coming from the city because that determines how much we pay. If we know how many they, there are, we must know who they are because we have to count them somehow. So if the counting and the identification takes place, there must be a way within the database to tag people so that the data can be pulled out in a subset of the greater pool. It, it might take some effort, but it can't be that complicated. And I have been told by people in the school system that the city has a percentage higher of children on free and reduced lunch than the county. Mm -hmm. So if they've got that data, they must be able to get other data. Well, I, I think this is all a discussion that, that we need to, to start both with our school board members and, and with the school administration. And, and I think, as Mr. Tuttle suggested, the more specific we can be 
uh, as we approach them, the, the better. But I think uh, I will uh, take this discussion, and Mr. Tuttle and I will have a discussion and approach the school board, our school board members, and, and the school administration. When is your next uh, liaison committee meeting? It's probably this. Uh, we do it quarterly, don't we? I think it's in yeah. April. I can't yeah. tell you just when. Yeah. So it may, it's probably not before the <laughs> council. I don't think there'll be a design committee meeting, but that doesn't preclude us from well, addressing the question to, to, to our school board members and, and through them to the administration. We're in a particularly good time in the, with a fresh administration to right. be doing this as well. Okay. I have a bit more new business. If okay. You can, with the council's blessing, I, I would like to take a look at the process for regulating uh, the rental of rooms to roomers in owner-occupied dwellings. Um, in particular, I'd like to know the feasibility of moving to an administrative process for the addition of more than one rumor to a particular dwelling. Uh, I, I know that this will uh, present several variables in regard to um, parking, um, length of permit and inspection process, um, if staff could come back to council with several options in regard to these variables, um, uh, once council see those, we can decide which, if any, we uh, want to refer to planning commission. We might be helpful if you just explain the difference between rumor and oh, sure, rental. Sure. Maybe, sure. Maybe Mr. Nestor could address sort of what the current regulations are and what the current definitions are um, if, if that we are talking about rental of rooms and owner occupied single family dwellings we have two categories one is bed and breakfast and the other one is rental to rumors the ordinance now allows a, an owner-occupied single-family dwelling to rent one room to one roomer, no questions asked, no extra parking asked, you can just do it. If you want to, you can rent up to two rooms to up to four roomers, which would be two roomers in a room. Uh, if you obtain a special exception from the Board of Zoning Appeals and uh, there are various requirements in the ordinance, there are some requirements for parking and so on, but as opposed to the changes that were recently made allowing in a single family dwelling it to be occupied by four rather than three unrelated people, that is an administrative procedure if you meet certain standards, but right now rental to rumors once you go over the one is a board of zoning appeals if, if you want to rent to one is there any application or any there's no, you, so you just do it you can do it without any any city involvement Correct. at all uh -huh. but if you if you want to do more than one then the maximum would be two rooms to a maximum of four people and that can be done only with a, a bza approval correct okay and so what what I understand what you're asking for is asking staff to look at that and see if there might be some way to streamline, streamline the, the, the process for more than one and what limits might exist and what it's so, so a whole range of questions. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And Mr. Nestor, the distinction between uh, a rumor and somebody in a B and B, obviously the facility has to be uh, have a B and B certificate, but is it also the uh, transient occupancy definition that helps determine that? Uh, I guess in part, but being, well, it's it's referred, I think the ordinance refers to it as rental of rooms to visitors, and that's the, tr that's the transient occupancy, and you need a business license. And, and again, that goes through a Board of Zoning Appeals process that also is limited to owner-occupied dwellings, and it's further limited along certain specified corridors in the city, and there is a certain uh, maximum number of, of houses that can be rented to visitors. For rumors, there's no 
limit, there's no corridor. It's just you have to go to the Board of Zoning Appeals on a case-by-case -case basis. And, and you're, you're not addressing the, the B and B question. No, no. This is just totally about the this is a specifically right. yeah. long-term rental of rooms in an owner-occupied dwelling. Is, is that Mr. Tuttle? Is that request clear? Okay. Yes, and we will try. Is, is council? Yeah, I think it's council. Okay. Yeah, if, if you could look at that and come back to us with some some recommendations, we'll do that. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. Perfect. Any other new business? If not, we'll move to our last uh, agenda item for today. This is open forum. This is a time when anyone who wishes to speak to council may do so. I have one speaker's card from Randy O'Neill. Yes. Oh. Glad I have a short walk. A little stiff today. Uh, Randy O'Neill, uh, Jane City County, 109 Sheffield Road. I'm here to talk about uh, health and wellness, and uh, there is no more important issue today than that. Obviously, the three things that you considered today, uh, the first statements you all made was health, wellness, and safety. I'm concerned about that in the schools and how little is uh, being done uh, to uh, look after the money that's being spent now to improve health and PE uh, as well as ship and um, how uh, uh, James City County in Williamsburg is uh, uh, endowed with that wonderful foundation and how little of the money is reaching the students. A lot of money has been spent over the last three years, three and a half million. Now sadly they've only um, had a thousand students participate in ship okay at fifty dollars an hour so they pay fifty dollars an hour per student so uh, they made burritos at one school that was ten students made uh, ten burritos that was five hundred bucks there was recently uh, they had a class on uh, Zumba dancing ballroom dancing um, they're limited because they just can't control that many third graders uh, in that kind of activity uh, so when you think about ten uh, times fifty bucks that's five hundred bucks okay so when you look at a program like mine, um, which is one of a kind, um, and has won the 2007 Community Leadership Award from the Department of Health and Human Services, and you go and find data like this, which was um, overall health rankings for um, all the towns, counties, and cities in, in, in the state of Virginia. James City County has uh, health factors of two. We're second to best, yet we have an 11th outcome. Sadly, I, I couldn't find my second page. Now, Williamsburg's not even on the first page. And there's 38 communities ahead of you. And we've got 150 million sitting over there. We spent three and a half million dollars on staff and consultants. I, I'm, I'm petrified at how little is being done to oversee a few what I consider rogue administrators who are spending a whole lot of money on people that seem familiar to them. And um, uh, recently, Mr. Becker, uh, um, Burke Buckler, excuse me, said in the uh, Gazette, that health and PE and this new law um, was unexpected and catastrophic. Well, it's been part of their policy since 2005. So it's not uh, a surprise. I've been bringing it to them to their attention. SHIP doesn't address any of their policy. That was three and a half million dollars. I worked with them for uh, two years and it took um, three and a half months to work 40 hours. Okay? And sadly, um, I'm here to tell you that I've spoken to over 2,500 students, elementary students. I was at Matoka this Tuesday. Okay, I had 250 children through in two hours. It was 200 bucks. That's what I bill, $100 an hour. So health and PE in school is $70 an hour, as well as reading, math, science, $70 an hour per student. So if you have 20 kids in that health and PE class, that's 1,400 bucks. 20 kids in my program is 100 bucks, although I can handle 30, and it's still 100 bucks. So until private business takes on these schools, and you're looking at 4 million for a gym, and you're not even paying heating, cooling, staff, blah, blah, blah. 4 million. Now I've been operating for seven years. They could have had me there for 600 bucks a day and I would have taken you know, 420 kids. And I have measured outcomes. Now, I've never been hired by the city of Williamsburg once. Now, I've worked in Williamsburg over at Eastern State for two years, every Wednesday, with CEO. 
and enable those kids who do not graduate health and PE to graduate health and PE. And this is where my, 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 my big problem with, with the local authorities, Park and Rec, we have the best fields, but fields don't equal health. It just doesn't happen. Now, sadly, I'm not in this Matoka brochure, but every other vendor in here that works with children is. That's not a surprise to me. They often don't recognize me. I'm not worried about that. The children do, and I appreciate them for that. So once again, this information, and Mr. Pons, thank you for bringing up the schools. Uh, we really need to do a better job. 58% of our children met the minimum fitness requirement this year or last year. 58 percent and we are spending a whole lot of money. A whole lot of money. 1,700 kids, 1.7 million for athletics. We need to flip that maybe. Get involved in health rather than a game and uh, start these kids early. But once again, I've not been at uh, uh, Matthew Whaley, Mr. Franklin, since I met you and your daughter there that time. That's three years ago. So that gym hasn't changed in how many years? So when you're building these large expanses of space, what, what is the outcome of it? You know, I've got 320 square feet, but I, got, I have 30 bicycles in there. We roll. I mean roll. And I'm watching brain cells grow right in front of me. And it's boys and girls. And I'm often outridden by girls in polka dot skirts. It's really embarrassing sometimes. Tomorrow I will be in Albemarle where I will be training the majority of Tony Bennett, the uh, uh, basketball coaches' kids, football coaches' kids, all in that school. 700 bucks, 465 children. So when you look at SHIP, a million bucks a year, and we're only reaching 1,000, we got to do a lot better. Thank you so much for your time. Keep up the good work. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Um, does anybody else wish to address on any, any matter? Uh, please come forward and state your name and, and address. Hello again. Hello. I'm Lois Klein, and I hope you received the email that I sent Ms. Scott. Yes, ma'am. Oh, Ms. Scott. I think all of the council has received your remarks in advance, and, and we've Great. taken a look at those. Uh, thank you. I know I have only three minutes, and I'll be as fast as I can. I have done some research about the deferral, um, which is uh, mentioned uh, in the Code of Law for Virginia and the City Code. and. It seems to um, interchange the terms deferral and exclusion, and with no definition as to um, who qualifies for what. The financial um, deferral exclusion measures are the same, I would imagine, for both, and I don't know how it's differentiated. There is the requirement that the property on which the real estate taxes are deferred or excluded um, be the sole residence of the person requesting it, which it is. Um, evidently, the assessor figured since I had uh, referred my mail to another address that it was not my sole residence, and I explained to him, uh, or actually to someone who worked with him, and Mr. Matson. And I think you were at a meeting, Mr. Tuttle, as well, and, and Ms. Shelton, you were there? Because I have a letter uh, from Mr. Sarah stating that. Um, and that you agreed that um, uh, I should not be um, allowed um, that exemp exemption or deferral, whichever it was, um, that occurred in, in 2010. And I was accepted for that in July of 2009. Um, what happened is that banks have changed their policies, and that's what brought this to a head. And because they want to foreclose on properties where the mortgages were from a bank they bought that they don't want, what they have done is made requirements that may not have been previously known, and in my respect, that is the fact that they've assigned an escrow account. They don't, re um, I was told on the telephone, they do not consider deferrals as valid. Um, 
as ex exclusions, but they will respect exclusions. And so what my email said was that seniors don't benefit from this program if it's not an exclusion, because the escrow amount includes future taxes that might be assessed. And the bank can pretty much do whatever they want, and now they are requiring almost double the monthly payments I used to make because of the escrow account. They called up, asked if I paid my real estate taxes. The answer was no. I don't know if they said I was in the deferral program, but my subsequent follow-up um, was that I was in the program. And they said, well, they can put in the escrow account whatever they want, and it can include future taxes. And because it was a deferral and not an exclusion, I had to pay that escrow account up front before I would be allowed to make my mortgage payment. So in January, my mortgage payment wasn't accepted. I received notice in February that my house was going into foreclosure because I had defaulted on two payments. That was about a week ahead of the second payment being due. So you can see how, you know, they're, they're putting these things into practice in an effort to foreclose. And because of the program for which I was qualified, I am now in danger of losing my home. I did leave to go and see my new granddaughter who was born in September of 2009, and I stayed into 2010, but the dates they'd given in the letter they sent me are entirely wrong. They said they'd gotten it from the post office. I don't know what caused the delay, because I went in, in September of 2009, and I returned within six months. There is no requirement as to how much time you need to spend in your sole residence in order to qualify. There are only monetary, monetary requirements. And that's why I'm saying that what's happening in this time of great financial um, duress is that the banks are taking advantage of liberties they never had before. And because of that, I don't think any senior who has a mortgage is benefiting from this program. And possibly it should be changed to only an exclusionary program. Um, in my case, what I'm here to accomplish, and of course it can't be done today, I realize I couldn't get on the agenda for today, and I'd be happy to be on the agenda for next month, um, is that the money be refunded to the bank that they paid. They paid penalties, they paid what was assessed, and what they think will be assessed in the future. And I have to pay that before they'll accept a mortgage payment. They have refused them all. Well, thank you. We don't typically respond, but in this case, because we've gotten your uh, remarks in, in advance, uh, we've asked staff to look at that. I think we're, we're going to be, be briefed by the attorney on some of the issues, and we, we've asked staff to look at this. Some of it has to deal with the, 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 the nature of the state program. Uh, again, we're dealing rural state, and cities only have the authorities that are given to them by the state. So uh, we need to find out more about that. Um, I will say, however, that, that this is a, you know, City Council is a, a policy board. We set the policy. It's carried out by, by the staff and the administrators. And I think the, the appeal for this process is really to the administrative process. Uh, City Council doesn't have an official role in this. But uh, again, those are questions that we have for staff. And, and we will find out more. And we will be back to you. Yeah, I think the policy of having deferral only instead of exclusion is what I'm asking you to take a look at. And also the fact that um, I, and I do have the state code of law here. Um, I did research that. And it doesn't give any limit, limitations. It says um, that the only violation um, would be that you die <laughs> or, or your, your property is no longer owned by you. And what's happening is that I'm fast going to become um, an ex-owner if this continues. Well, again, I've, we've asked the city attorney to, to look into this, and, and we, will, we will find out more, and, and we will be, be back to you.
Okay, and, and I'd like Ms. Shelton's card, if I may. I was told to, to contact her, but I haven't been able to do so. Well, after the meeting, we'll make sure that you get that card. And, Thank and, you. And, and any other information. And I, I appreciate your listening. Thank you very much and your attention to this. Anybody else wish to address City Council on any matter? I'm John Whitley, 110 Governor Berkeley Road not necessarily representing any group, organization, or business. I thought, as and Mr. Pons, if I may, Mr. Mr. Mayor, speak, I appreciate your comments about the school system. My intent of coming before you at this open forum was to say that as a citizen, I am really perturbed to look at what has happened to James Blair as a, an institution of, of public education and the manipulation of that facility by administrative decision making. I believe I am correct when I say that the two representatives uh, of city council who are seated on the school board did not vote in favor of the alteration of that facility. I could stand corrected, but I think I am correct. I find that type of action of a singular group, i.e. James City County school board members taking an action that in my perception was adverse to the overall public education facilities and processes is just not right and it's not that which I think we spend our monies for as a city. I don't know who the decision makers were, maybe one is presently in Georgia, but I'm not certain. But I do feel strongly that whoever helped facilitate that process, they need to be held accountable. Speaking of accountability, I heard, Mr. Mayor, you're saying, well, for years we've asked that they give us information about this. Well, here we are. We're going to give, we're giving the, uh, the Woodside apartment thing six months. I say we give, we give this, the school board administration uh, 60 days to bring forward the information that you're asked. We know exactly how many students we have. And because isn't that not the way we invest in this in public schooling in Williamsburg James City County? Uh, I am I am not a happy camper when it comes to what and I, I am an educator, so I'm not just shooting off from the from the hip or shooting from the hip. I'm not happy at all by that which I've seen in in the bringing forward the educational program and the administration of Williamsburg James City County Schools. I would hope that in your deliberation that you move forward quickly to look at what accountability is coming to us as a city from this joint venture and that we not afford any longer uh, our representatives who are there for us to permit the uh, school board not delivering information that we request. And wherever this discussion might take us and whatever the resolve might be, I think the guiding principle is that public education for the citizens of the children of the citizens of Williamsburg is the ultimate piece for your consideration. Uh, where that might go, who knows? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Anybody else wish to address City Council on any matter? If not, that brings us to the conclusion of our regular business. I believe we have some issues for closed session. Yes, we do. Mr. Mayor, I move to go into closed session pursuant to Section 2.2-3711 of the Code of Virginia for the purpose of discussing one personnel matter per subparagraph 1 concerning appointments and two legal matters per subparagraph 7 for the purpose of consultation with legal counsel pertaining to probable, probable litigation and consultation on a specific legal matter requiring legal advice by counsel. Second. I have a motion and a second. Would you call the roll, please, Ms. Scott? Ms. Nitsen. Aye. Mr. Collins. Aye. Ms. Mayor Hallman. Aye. Mr. Friday. Aye. Mr. Foster. Aye. We'll take a five-minute recess.